Thank you very much. And uh, thanks everybody to coming to this very last session. Thanks to the organizers um, for inviting me here. I wanted to be here also in the previous weeks, but it turned out to be actually impossible. But I'm happy that I can be here these few last days. So I come from uh, the city of Uvascula, which was perfectly pronounced. Thank you very much. Um, we are in the middle of the Lake District of the southern Finland, something like 300 kilometers north from Helsinki, which is the capital on the southern coast. So uh, our campus is, is uh, in both sides of this very nice lake, again, which is close to the town town. So Yvaskila is a small city, maybe 120,000 people. Um, and the lake, of course, is different in different times of the year. So in the winter time, we can do some uh, activity, sports activity there, like ski or, or skate. And of course, this time we can swim. The water is still sort of cold, but you know, you also have a big lake here, which is not very warm, I guess, at this time. So, so I have a, a very nice and diverse group of, of about 10 young scientists. They come from very different backgrounds. Um, most of them are computational material science, computational physicists by, by training. Uh, some are uh, quantum chemistry, computational chemistry people. Uh, I have one who is bioinformatics expert, and actually one and a half postdocs are also doing experiments. So uh, one of the postdocs is doing both simulations and experiments, actually planning uh, the future work in the lab by doing very heavy scale um, computer simulations, and that's actually the thing that I'm going to talk about today. And the other person is, is a shared postdoc with the physical chemistry group who is 100% who is experimentalist. And I think in this, Photo from last year, uh, we have people from seven nationalities, so it's, it's a very diverse group. So we are generally interested in nanoparticles, but um, not just any kind of nanoparticles. So when we say our systems are monodispersed, it really is monodispersed. In, in, in principle, plus or minus zero is the uncertainty. So we know what kind of atoms there are, what kind of lichens there are on the surface. So we basically can write the chemical formula for that. And uh, we are interested in uh, working with a lot of experiments uh, from this very <laughs> wide range of applications, really spanning catalysis, uh, biological uh, applications. And uh, we also have a person who has a project um, to look at uh, develop machine learning ways, machine learning methods to understand chemical potentials of these uh, small uh, molecules that actually nucleate or can nucleate aerosol formation in in atmosphere. So I can say that we are really working on a very large scale of applications. So we are computational scientists mostly, and something about, about methods. So we are sort of here in the middle region. So we are not, at least not at the moment, using coarse grained methods, which has been a very important topic here this week. We are not using uh, like this highly dimensional quantum chem uh, chemistry wave function methods. But so we are we are using, if you, look, if you want to look at the electronic structure of these materials or these, these building blocks of materials, these clusters, we are using density functional theory, which I think is, is most familiar with most of you. So it's, it's a very powerful method to actually treat thousands of valence electrons in, in, in these systems if you are interested in electronic or optical or chiroptical CD properties like that. But then actually the work that I'm going to talk about today is, is utilizes, needs to utilize um, classical force fields that we also have parameterized some of these systems some years ago. So we are doing classical magnetodynamics, these, these systems in solvents. And uh, applications will be in water uh, today. So uh, this field of atomically precise nanoclusters has been there. It's sort of an old field, but it's also sort of a young field. Um, some of you may know a bit of the history, so the first crystal success of very small gold clusters with phosphines. I think they were done in Europe, in, in Italy, something like 1968 or 69. Um, but then uh, important uh, developments happened in mid-1990s, Bruce and Schifrin in UK and, and collaborators, they, they published the Chemcom paper where they I said how tiles can stabilize very small to a couple of nanometer diameter size uh, gold nanoclusters. 
And then uh, several groups like Rob Wetzen, uh, Georgia Tech, and Royce Murray, late Royce Murray in, uh, in Chapel Hill, they started working on this around the turn of the century and millennium. And then um, 2007, Roger Conway's group published this science cover article uh, of this first uh, really atomically precise, significant uh, 102 gold atom cluster with, with uh, BMP tiles. And that boosted the field a lot. And since then, um, I have a postdoc who tries to keep track how many crystal structures are being published. And I think he has now more than 200 of these structures in the database. So we have our own sort of coordinate database because obviously we use these structures for, for many simulations as starting structures. We can make, of course, beautiful illustrations. So everything that you see here is sort of real in a sense that the coordinates are from literature from published crystal structures. If you look at the electronic properties, like uh, how this uh, homo lumo or, or quantum gap develops, of course it goes from the very small sizes, can be even two, three electron volts, to um, close to the zero, so this, if this is gold or silver, uh, it becomes more metallic, and of course at some point becomes plasmonic, as, as Oleg was talking just before the, before the lunch. So we are sort of in the range of being small molecules or, or small semiconductor-like, but novel metal clusters uh, up to the range where these systems become uh, plasmonic. And of course, then this is what happens in the electronic structures. So we have the quantum states here, and then this electronic structure is reflected, let's say, by this fingerprint-like, very peaked optical absorption spectrum. Most of these systems are also chiral, so also the chiral CD spectra, are CD, CD signals are like fingerprints for, for these chemicals or for these structures. And we are not so much interested in this large colloidal uh, gold or silver nano, nano cluster, uh, uh, nano particle size. So, um, so this shows some over the several years, just some examples of, of what we have been doing. And, and most of these involve actually really close collaboration with some of these groups, chemistry groups that can make these, characterize, and then think about applications. Like I have had for many years very nice collaborations to Shaman University in China uh, from Nanfeng Sheng, who is one of the best experts to make these clusters, particularly silver clusters or silver gold mixed clusters. We have looked at how they can be catalysts uh, in, in solvents. So it's an interesting concept. So it's not really heterogeneous. It's, on, it's not homogeneous. It's something in between because you have a monodispersed sample of similar clusters in, in solution, in solvent and then the catalysis reactions happens there. Or then we had the more recent uh, paper where, we, where they actually made in China these kind of polymeric crystals, so single crystal, which is shown by, which is, um, which is showing these uh, linked clusters of, of precise formulation. And then we showed by DFT calculations that these are sort of semiconductor materials, but they are conducting, semiconducting in this one direction only, and then they are insulating in the other directions. With the group in Singapore, we, we worked on, we helped them to actually interpret very high resolution electron microscopy pictures of, of, again, these cluster materials where very small gold clusters with tiles are sort of organizing, again, in these kind of polymeric forms along one direction. So these are very unisotropic materials, actually. Uh, then with uh, experimentalists in our center in Yuvascular, we have been recently looking at how Gold clusters with dye molecules, how they can take the dye molecules inside living cells, and how you can do some fluorescence microscopy to, to use these clusters, at least qualitative sensors, for local pH inside the cell, which is very important, an interesting topic for the biologist to, to understand how the pH is, is uh, variation, uh, what are the variations of the pH and, and why, uh, why this happens in the cell. So this is co uh, controlled by this. Uh, basic electrostatic interaction between the charged surfaces of the, of the gold cluster of the ligand layer and then the dye molecule, which is positively charged. And then this local surface charge is very sensitive to the pH invariant, of course. The basic idea is very simple, but to prove it experimentally and then to do supporting simulations, that has been a project actually for a few years. Uh, many years ago, we used, again, uh, these clusters. Uh, they were made in our center by our colleagues in chemistry and our virus biology colleagues use these to image enteroviruses. So, so this is a real electron microscopy picture taken in, in your vascular. It's about 30, 35 nanometers across. 
sort of icosahedral virus, and, and then you can see sort of the structure of the virus because you see these individual gold, again, gold 102 clusters, and we did some modeling and molecular dynamics for that. So quite many applications um, already now, and, and I think this sort of the subfield of larger, huge nanoparticle um, community is, is growing, and, and maybe a most recent, well, most recent uh, review, at least from us, is, is that just came out a couple of months ago, if you're interested, the book I edited with my Japanese colleague is already old, but uh, yeah, that was the state of the art 2015. But the field is really developing, and these structures are coming um, uh, in, in a rapid uh, stage. And just, I already said that, that this paper by Roger Kornberg in 2007 uh, really sparked a lot of interest in the field. Of course, the synthesis was basically done already in 94, but it took more than 10 years to, for the people to find the first crystal structure. And this is a 3D, 3D printed model that I have in my office about, about this same structure. Um, used to using the, the crystal coordinates. So, okay, so the crystal structures are very nice because, because um, obviously if we want to do atomic scale calculations, either molecular dynamics with pre-parameterized force fields or DFT calculations to understand the electronic structure and optical structure and so on, it's, we have to put the atom somewhere in the system. So uh, crystal structure is the best starting point. But then uh, one always has to Remember that this is just one snapshot, or this is how the system has decided to self-assemble or reorganize or organize itself into the into the solid form um, <clears throat> under those conditions where the crystal has grown. And uh, so then, if you want to um, conjugate this with proteins that I will show today, uh, you have to be able to say something about how dynamic or what what fluctuates what the lichen layer does let's say at room temperature aqueous uh, solvent with counter ions and everything. And for that, um, we, we do have the force field that, that we believe is pretty good and it's also used by other groups now for many years in the field. And this is the same famous gold 102, uh, BMPF 44 uh, cluster that uh, we tested or simulated quite soon after we had done the force field. And it is the same as maybe 50 or 40 nanosecond simulation in water. Water is not expected shown, but the water molecules are there, also contents are there. And it's the same structure just from two different viewpoints. So this, uh, that ligand is that red ligand and so on. So you see that something happens here, something happens maybe there. And uh, <clears throat> um, the crystal structure of this is interesting. So if you look at it's the, the metal core is highly it has a decahedral, so five-fold rotational symmetry, as you can actually see maybe here. Uh, not anymore, but in the initial position maybe better. But then the lichen layer has only C2 symmetry. So there are 44 lichen C2 symmetry, so 22 symmetry environments. And uh, for instance, if you look at the, the uh, NMR spectrum that we, that we got, okay, that comes in the next slide. And there is a lot of signals to, to actually figure out. And, and so the question is, can we understand something of how this structure changes and what is the structure of this when it's really in dynamical state in room temperature solvent? So from this previous uh, animation or the simulation, we analyzed some of these lichens. And uh, it's quite surprising is that, of course, there's no diffusion. Uh, it, actually, our force field doesn't even allow bond breaking. So this is. This is the amber compatible chromax used force fields that, that is tuned for these weak interactions between the organic surface of the nanocluster or particle and then whatever biosystem there is on the other side. So we are not intended to do any, any reorganization of the, let's say, the sulfur gold bonds or any, anything inside, any covalent bonds or metallic bonds inside the system. We look at the interface, but still all the atoms are dynamic, so we have a bunch of harmonic potentials there. So nothing breaks or nothing diffuses, but still this uh, roots mean square uh, displacement here um, average over tens of, tens of nanoseconds of simulation time shows that um, these lichens are very individual guys. So they have their own micro environment and then they hang out with this lichen or this lichen. They have pi uh, pi interactions. They have other type of weak interactions, dispersion interactions are in the model. And some are, some are sort of, they are just 
flipping back and forth maybe with two positions all the time. And the mobility, as we define it here, as, as a time average value of the RMSD in Angstrom, can be something like eightfold uh, difference. So between the most stable ligand and then the most dynamic ligand, the two dances around a lot. So that's quite interesting and important. And without this extra dynamical information and this, this classical simulations, we would not have been able to, for instance, assign this uh, uh, very messy and complicated uh, proton NMR spectrum that we got many years ago from, from a collaborator, Chris Ackerson from Colorado State. And then my postdocs, Kirsi and Sami, they really did a lot of detective work. It, we needed to do, of course, TFT calculations starting from the Krista Saxe and looking at those 22 different symmetry environments. That could explain some of these uh, uh, shifts. And of course, we also looked at the two or three different type of 2D correlation NMR spectra. I'm not going into the detail, but we analyzed all that. But then uh, to really explain to assign basically all the peaks, we also had to consider the, the, dynam uh, the dynamic uh, motion of the ligands and then how the environments are changing uh, during the course of the simulation. But we were able to do it. So, so what this paper basically shows that, yeah, you can, the starting point, the crystal, the crystal success starting point, of course, which is the only starting point for us, there's, there's nothing else given to us, is really a good and valid starting point also to, to uh, analyze or interpret uh, pretty complicated um, NMR spectra, but you need to include these dynamics uh, from molecular dynamic simulations to be able to, to understand it really completely or almost completely. And then another example, so this is the, the gold 102 again. This is the much smaller, very well known since more than 10 years, a very well studied cluster. It's 25 gold, only 18 of these similar, similar ligands, water soluble ligands. But here, actually, this is a snapshot after, again, a long, long simulation. And there we have this nice punching or packing pi pi interactions, punching of the ligands. So with this smaller, higher curvature nanoparticle or cluster surface, um, actually sort of the ligand density is, is, is not uniform. It's much uniform in this gold 102. And we see that in this peak structure of the pair correlation function between this carbon and carbon seal. So among, among these size variations, they can be actually quite surprising and inter interesting and important, we think. Uh, important differences is how the ligand structure uh, organizes itself, and it can be different from what this is from the crystal sucks. So now coming to this sort of the topic, so uh, what has been done in the field in the, in the past maybe 10, 15 years with these ultra-small nanoparticles? Um, for bio-applications bio or biomedical applications is something like this. So we discussed this in, in another review recently with my postdoc. So uh, I already showed what we had done in Uvascular many years ago, so we can simply use as a passive contrast agent. Of course, gold as a heavy metal, a high electron density, it's a, it's a really nice contrast material for electron microscopy of, of viruses, which basically are full of proteins, full of carbon, more or less. <clears throat> And it's, if it's on the carbon grid or graphene uh, grid, uh, it's carbon on carbon. So you need really contrast there to see something. Or uh, people have used this as radio sensitizers, uh, let's say in the cancer therapy. So you can functionalize these to be water soluble and to be active with bio molecules, seek uh, maybe cancer cells. And then you can either radiate them with uh, ultraviolet or uh, soft x-rays and uh, many things can happen. They can, for instance, release electrons, so they become ionizing, uh, um, uh, ionizing particles. Um, electrons can also activate nearby oxygen species to be reactive oxygen species that are harmful for the environment. Or they can even be uh, X-ray fluorescent, so secondary fluorescence can, uh, in X-ray region can, can come out. So uh, radiation uh, therapy applications have been studied quite a lot. Or then, uh, particularly silver, everybody knows, but nobody understands. At least I don't understand. I try to ask everybody who does this. Silver is an antibacterial agent, but I don't know how this actually works in the molecular scale. Somehow it breaks, I guess, the, the cell membranes of, of bacteria, but, uh, but I do not know how it, how it works. So 
So this is a, a brief uh, recap of what has been done and what could be done. And of course, the idea here is that everything is, is really small, it's nicely precise. It's, it's a couple of nanometers, um, nanoparticle. And because you know the chemical formula, it is like a molecule. If you're a chemist in this field, you can treat it as a, as a molecule, you can make the molecular material, you can store it, and you can use it uh, after a couple of years and it's still the same molecular material. So there are these uh, different parts of the system that you can try to tune and functionalize to optimize to your application. Of course, the metal, basically, whether it is, it is gold or silver or copper or some mix of those, uh, mainly affects the optical properties, electronic structure, maybe plasmonic properties in this region where become, the things are becoming large and plasmonic. And then uh, this uh, ligand layer, of course, and the surface defines the solubility of the system, whether it is organosoluble or, or water-soluble system. And then you have this uh, interface to wherever you want to link it in the biological environment. And in principle, um, all of these could be worked on. Um, and uh, what we try to say is that, that because the system are in principle, hand, um, we can handle almost everything in computation. Some of them become very large scale, as you will see. But it is understandable in the atomistic picture or molecular level uh, description. Uh, we can build this kind of a feedback loop with, uh, with uh, experimental groups who can then try to, let's say, tweak the synthesis to uh, tune the properties or tune the structure or the size or the shape to be really optimal for certain, let's say, biological application. So, so uh, the application comes here now, and uh, this is what I will, I will show um, the rest of the talk in the next about five to 10 minutes. So this is the project of, of my um, postdoc, uh, Francisca who is the person who does both really large-scale computer simulations and then goes to the lab and tries to make these systems and then uh, see how they work with uh, cancer cells in the future. So, <clears throat> and the first paper came out just about one and a half years ago. We were happy to get the cover of this first uh, ACS uh, journal in this first issue of this new journal in nanoscience. So the idea here is that, uh, that uh, we want to target, so we want to make nanosystems that can carry conventional drug molecules against cancer to the right place, not just to any cell, not to healthy cells, but to most probably target the, the cancerous cells. And the idea there is that, that these cancer cells are known to have overexpressed uh, receptor proteins, and uh, then we have to find a targeting motif, a targeting molecule uh, that we can put into the ligand layer together with the drug and with this normal um, pyelate that is uh, protecting it and making it water soluble so that this, this targeting motif, which is now peptide here, can find uh, most likely the, the sick cell or the cancer cell, not the healthy cell, and then carry the drug to the right place. And uh, we used as a model, uh, uh, a model which is really realistic, so there are clusters very close to these that can be made synthetically and that are known to exist and have these kind of structures. And uh, then uh, the idea is that we want to modify. This is easy in computations. It's much more difficult when to make these lignan exchange reactions in the right, uh, right concentration ratio. But in, in the models, we know what to modify and what to build. So we will uh, use uh, mostly, of course, the undisturbed lignan layer. But then we can then we put there a certain number of these uh, targeting peptides and then then these uh, drug molecules. And uh, um, the first stage was already done a couple of years ago, so the first we looked at what kind of peptides we could select, and uh, this was just based on conventional docking calculation between a docking simulation between this, at this interface, so between the targeting motif of the peptide and then this uh, alpha, beta, integral, that's the receptor there. And uh, these are the scores, so we, we selected a couple of the peptides that seemed to find best, just at that interface uh, based on the docking simulation. And then we selected uh, a number of known chemo drugs against this cancer, and uh, then made the models uh, with uh, two different concentration ratios of the drugs, peptides, and then the rest on the BMBA-type molecules. 
So in total, we had almost 30 systems to start the screen. And then we performed with this uh, force field we have before, have been tested, uh, classical MD simulations with this well-known software for uh, about half a microseconds. We could have done even, even longer systems uh, for some of these, but we decided that this half a microsecond, 500 nanoseconds seems to be enough to see the qualitative behavior, systematic behavior, what happens with this, uh, in this ligand layer. And now the interesting question is, uh, is this peptide that we are selecting with this drug, this combination, um, does it seem potent? So, so uh, the criteria we were looking at is this targeting motif, which is the RGD here. Is it more like this, most, most uh, part of the life of the simulation? So exposed out into the solvent, ready to find the integrin? Or is it sort of curved in? Is it, is it uh, interacting with the drug or is it interacting with the BMP ligand layer? We actually find qualitatively uh, really different uh, systems here. So here are sort of the, one of the good systems. So we have this exposed motif, which is all the way, the center of the mass of, of these molecules is furthest away from the center of the cluster. But we also had these uh, sort of intermingled uh, configurations where, where the targeting motif is now buried um, inside the system and, and interacting, for instance, with the drug molecule. So we could screen all these, and uh, after these quite long simulations, about 30 of those, and we were able to select a few of the most promising combinations between the peptides and, and the drugs. Okay, and then the next thing is that we have to have an estimate how how strong uh, is this binding interaction with the, with the integrin, so with the protein uh, receptor site. And for that, we did, again, classical um, um, pulling MD simulations and using the umbrella sampling technique to estimate the free energy of the work, which is then the estimate for the binding energy. So we are, we are equilibrating the system in the binding configuration for all these interesting systems that we wanted to study further, and then we are sort of forcing the the contact to break, and they're using the US, the umbrella sampling to, to um, estimate the, the, the free energy of the work in the, in the simulation. And we found the winners uh, on, on the best performance here um, by basically looking at how, how these uh, uh, saturated values of, of this free energy of binding uh, behave with all these different combinations of peptides and drugs that we, we tested. So uh, we are now more or less in this this stage, so uh, still have to publish uh, at least one paper on finalizing all these, these uh, simulation results. And then, of course, the, the lab work will, will follow. It has already been starting, so Francisca has been validating some of these clusters. She knows how to make them. She knows that how to make the ligand exchange reactions, but, but that, that path is still there to be, to be worked on. Um, and we have a very nice sort of environment and infra infrastructure in our lab or in our uh, nanosense center. We can work with uh, local people also from other departments, faculties, to even get really human serum samples from sports science people in our faculty and in, in our university and actually expose these functional astronomy clusters to, to human serum and then do mass spectrometry in, in other places in Europe or in Singapore to see um, what actually binds and, and what, what kind of biomolecules are binding into the, into the system from human serum. So this becomes, of course, the, really like a next generation study. Will take certainly uh, a few years, I think, to, to get to uh, really uh, next steps in the, in the experimental part. But now we have done more or less the computational planning of this set of experiments and and this computational planning even would not have been po possible without this really excellent supercomputer resources we have in Finland. I really have to acknowledge our National Computing Center in Helsinki. Um, so we had, I, I showed this in a few minutes, but basically the, the work clock time to do all these screening uh, simulations and set up the systems analyze was something like one year for Francisca, and uh, we used close to 20 million CPU hours in para massively parallel supercomputers in, in this one. So it was sort of a grand challenge project in the Finnish scale. And without these resources, we would not have been able to, to get the results we have now. So now we have sort of planned. What should happen in the, in the lab, and now is really exciting state to see. And 
see and what will happen in the lab in the next uh, year or two. And uh, I think my time is exactly up, so thank you for attention. <clears throat> Thanks for the great talk. Uh, questions? Yeah, thank you very much for this. Uh, I, I, I find this really fascinating, this work with these atomistically precise yeah. nanoparticles. And I'm also not an expert here, but how do I have to imagine these particles? Because there's a very precise combination between the core, so the, yeah. uh, the metallic core and the ligands. Yeah. What happens if you have like a few too many ligands or if you have a few too many, uh, too many particles in the core? Is that a bit like a, like a nucleus where, where you then have atomic decay and you're sort of expelling uh, like a smaller uh, nanoparticle to get back to a magic number? I mean, they're also, they're essentially magic number clusters, if I Yeah, if I so this there right. are this magic number concept of electronic Cell filling, electronic stability for the small or, or the geometric, so let's say, icosahedral cells, or, or usually these small particles like this one are very spherical and icosahedral cells. Um, this is a tricky question because I think no, nobody still understands, experimental point of view, how these are formed in solvent. So, so you, you, you mix in, in your solvent, the water or organic solvent, your gold salt or silver salt or whatever you want to put there. So you bring the metal in, in the salt form there. It is oxidized to plus one or plus three maybe in the gold. Then you have to put reducing agent. You have to put the, uh, the protecting ligand there, so like a thiolate, and dissolve everything there. And then something happens. And after a few minutes or maybe a couple of hours, you have a reaction mixture. Then you have to purify it, like HPLC method. And then you have these purified samples. And then you have to analyze what you had, like mass spec or or or. In the best, best, best case, you are, you are lucky and you crystallize it and then you see what's there. So there's a lot of these discrete sizes, so a couple of hundred combinations, but they are all discrete points. And uh, we don't really know, is it just because everybody is using the same kind of synthetic recipe that nobody has been able to, usually, okay, this is my impression as, as, a, as, a, as a computer scientist, and I know this will be recorded and will be there forever, so I hope that I don't, <laughs> often my experimental colleagues, because I hear these stories that, okay, my student made a mistake. He or she mixed these uh, chemicals, not, not in the book recipe order, and he or she got something new. So one should not always try to copy what every other lab is doing and try to make the same, but if you make mistakes, so, so the, the world is sort of discrete, so like in this iceberg. We don't have icebergs in, in, in Finnish seas, but anyway, so we are close enough. So, you know, iceberg has like the 10 or 15 percent is, is, is these tops or the peaks. Everything is connected under the, under the surface of the sea and we don't see really what's the connection. So there must be, of course, unifying chemistry. Um, but is it really just that these certain sizes are so magic and so, so thermodynamically or kinetically stable that under these normal conditions you only get these? So you have, let's say, you have 102 gold atoms and 44 tiles. We haven't seen 105 gold atoms and 40 tiles or so there's an infinite number of, of course, combinations of, of what, what could happen there. But we have these discrete sizes so far. And, uh, and it has been sort of enough work for us and other theory people to try to figure out over these years why these sizes seem to be stable and matching. And we have found some reasons from the different structure theory and so on. So we haven't really sort of thought how you can modify, what kind of chemistry you have to do in the lab that you can, you can really, uh, let's say, partially deplete this layer and put some more metal atoms there or, or another type of lecan. So lecan exchange reactions happen and then usually you keep the same uh, chemical formula. So the same number of metal atoms, same number of, of, of lecans, but you can exchange another type of tile, for instance, there. So, and this is, of course, what we are also using in this, this peptide and drug business that we we can exchange, we can functionalize the, the, the surface, but the basic structure seems to be always the same. So it's, it's yeah, it's a good question, but, but the answer is long. <laughs> yeah. So I have a question more about the force field. Have yeah. Have the force field you developed? Yeah, we developed this 2016, yeah, JCTC. And for example, for water, what do you uh, we are using, so the force width is, is, is for this, this particle. And then in Gromax, if you know Gromax, so there's this amber compatible, so all these biomolecules, proteins, DNA is already there for a long time. For water, 
tip 3D, tip 3D. So we are using what, what is available. So we don't try to work on the fossils that are already there and, and this large community of biomolecular people have already tested so and validated so so new that the people there is this, this gold cluster and ligand, uh, this interface. And then you have this plot about NMR. That yeah. You were able to identify each and every peak from the simulation. Is that correct? So, yeah, so we could calculate uh, this. Um, okay, I'm wrong. We could... We could, yeah, so we could get basically the idea of, of the peaks. Um, so I, I don't remember any more the details so many years ago, but I think we got probably like two thirds of, of, of these peaks. We could assign basically calculating, um, taking the crystal structure and calculating the proton shifts as they are here. So this A and B, A and B aromatic protons here. So you're supposed to have so 22 symmetry environments and two signals, so 44 signals, and then times two. So everything's folded then to the full. So we could get like maybe two thirds of these already like an idea, okay, we are close to this and this and this uh, shift. But then uh, there is a lot of like very weak uh, signals and some peaks are sharper, some are broader. So to get all this sort of dynamic information we, we had to we had to actually do the MD simulations and see how how the how the symmetries are changing then in a certain places. So these these ligands that are most most movable, most dynamic, like, like this number twenty, wherever that is. Actually, the numbers are there. So if you can find, okay, here's number twenty. So this is basically the sequence of numbering from the Kornberg's first okay. crystal structure. So we can really look at let one by one all these ligands and they, they, they have numbers so they have names of the identities there. Yeah. And yeah. one more question is that um, when, I, when I was looking at the snapshots, the gold atoms are vibrating quite a bit. Yes, and yes. Is that, I mean, I, you know, you do, you do a very strong bond. I mean, I'm... Yes, but uh, actually gold, gold is soft metal. It is strong, it is a metallic bond. So the cohesive energy is like three points. 3.8 electron volts in bulk. Of course, here it's not really very small number of gold atoms at the center are in the bulk-like environment having like 12 nearest neighbors. And most of the gold atoms are really at the interface. So they have a very low coordination number, so they are supposed to be more dynamics. But um, we have actually a very simple pair potential for the gold, and it works in these highly symmetric cases. Um, which has, and the, the deep, uh, deep uh, the depth of the well has been fitted to, I guess, FCC called cohesive energies. Okay, so you. for gold, it's, it's really, really simple description. <clears throat> thank you very yeah. much. Very nice work. I actually have a quite related question. Well, thank you first uh, very much for, for speaking here because also I think we sometimes, the, the nanoparticle community kind of is not sufficiently connected to the cluster community, even yeah. though there's also a lot of things happening that are related. So yeah. it's great that you gave the talk. I have two questions. One is on the gold sulfur bond. So, I mean, the yeah. chemists tell me that this is a very complex bond. And uh, there's a big discussion, I think, about how many gold atoms and so on are involved and so on. This, is this relevant in these clusters? Is it known? Yes, it so involved? it's known, and and uh, I, I didn't really want to go into that level of detail, but so you already know a bit of the history. I think it's better known here, or better shown here. Yeah, yeah so this, this the one for four, which is sort of similar structure to the one or two. So there is this, this special thing that there are a lot of gold atoms actually already sort of mm. at the interface. So, so these, are the, these are the metallic gold atoms. Uh, close to oxidation state zero, and then these are close to oxidation state one. So mm -hmm. it's like code plus one and sort of negative sulfur, negative sulfur. So you can have a very simple like electron counting principle that gives you this electronic shell filling numbers on, on these systems. And actually my group contributed to this 2006. We have a paper in, in JPCB, I think, where we are sort of Predicted from DFT calculations for smaller gold clusters that these gold atoms should have these two oxidation states. Now, not many people believed it, but then next year came the science from Kornberg and they actually saw these units there explicitly. And, and, and now it has been as, is taken as, as, yeah, as a fact. 
And the second question is, if you now put on these peptides and drugs, is there a way to control on which of these atoms they, uh, molecules they go, or is that um, random? I think experimentally, it is very similar to things. So experimentally, we cannot really control where it goes. Mm. So, so for the computational model, of course, my postdoc had to build something. So we call it random, so it's basically just hand. You, you put it here. <laughs> That's what we do. And, and you can do, you cannot do all the, you know, combination, <laughs> combinatorial <laughs> things, uh, astronomical number here. So I think that her idea was that um, she puts them sort of as isolated as possible mm -hmm. so that they don't really start to, the peptides are very flexible, so they don't really start to interact right away. But experimentally, this is a spherical, nice synthetic particle, so we cannot really, I guess we cannot really, uh, did, too much to, to govern where the, the, where the peptide uh, the can goes. Thank you. Goes yes. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Yeah. Um, um, you discussed explicit water, but you did not, I think, discuss explicit charge or ions in the water. Yeah. I mean, if you're in Thank a you. physiological yes. condition, yes. So, uh, like carboxyl like, like, groups, yes. they charge? That's up? really a good question also. So uh, in, uh, yeah. Okay, like, like in these simulations here. Um, so we know, again, and that's another um, line of work in, in, uh, together with my group and, and this physical chemistry group. They have done this kind of titration experiment. So we know for them, some of these water soluble clusters, we know exactly the uh, what fraction of the ligands are going to be protonated or deprotonated as a function of pH. So they had done this titration curve. And in this kind of systems, around seven neutral conditions, it's almost fully deprotonated. So it has a very high negative surface charge. And then in the simulation, we have to balance the charge with positive, usually sodium plus. Um, and then uh, we add uh, sodium uh, chloride there, sort of to mimic the physiological salt concentration. So, so this is the recipe we do. The salt is built in. Oh, there. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But they, they are in, in, in biological systems. These are very highly uh, negatively charged particles. Yes, that's what we know from experiments. Thanks. Yeah. Um, the dielectric constant of gold is very different from from water. Um, how do you include uh, image charge or polarization effects in your force field? Uh, the, so you mean in the going all the way deep into the metal? Or? I mean in interaction between ions and, and in the presence of, uh, of the metal gold nanoparticle. Yes, so uh, this is not, in this level of the force field, it's not actually included here, so we don't have um, we don't really go beyond that uh, gold dielectric, gold sulfur interface. I Not see. at all. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you comment about uh, on uh, mobility of li ligand on a, on a particle? Yes. So what? What to comment? <laughs> this this uh, data, Amy? The mobility. Uh, this. Uh, or what? So how mobile? Okay, uh, the numbers are here. So uh, the scale is from half an angstrom to, and this is root mean square. So half an angstrom. Sorry, I don't to understand. Four. Kind of like x scale. So. Okay, so uh, the ligand size, if that's uh, yards, so that's about what 2.3 for that would be around six, seven angstrom, I think. And here we are four. So uh, if you think about how this would, for instance, flip back and forth, if this high number would come just this kind of mobility, it would really go to the side around the same way, same distance as the size of the molecule. So, oh, the x-axis. Ah, oh, this is just uh, this is just uh, the number of ligands. So we have all the 22 uh, symmetry equivalent ligands here. So this is not the dynamic, these are all time averages. These are time averages for these ligands over, over I think, 15 nanoseconds. Molecular dynamic simulation. But that's sort of center of mass displacement, right? Yes. But that might not involve detachment. Yes, I said, I think, I said here, 
in the talk that, that uh, our force will don't, don't allow breaking of any bond. So there's no diffusion, there's no bond breaking, there's no ignition exchange here. So this is just by vibration, vibration, rotation, but everything is, is fixed, anchored by the sulfur to the coat. He says that's exactly my question. Kind okay. of like the question about mobility of the ligands on a particle, it's a debatable. There are a variety of experiments. And I wanted to, yes. when I ask about comment, I kind of more implied in a, in a more general context. Okay. Yeah. So that's now I see your question. So, um, yeah. So, so the simulation is intended to describe the dynamics at, let's say, room temperature water. But then we know there's another field of, of, of this gold dilate, so-called sulfur chemistry, for 30 years, so from white sides and these famous people, these self-assembling monolayers of gold, of, of tiles on the, on the planar gold surface, called one-on-one. -on -one. And there, I think, at, even at room temperature, and of course, that's a completely different system, but even there, at room temperature, this sulfur-gold interface is sort of dynamic, so th there, are, there are diffusion happening and you can also exchange ligands there. So uh, you can induce chemistry, you can induce bond breaking, but in our models we are not including that. So the MD force field doesn't allow that because again, we are going to be more interested in what happens in the other interface. So on the organic surface and then the bio interface, not what happens at the gold sulfur interface inside the bond. But yeah, but that's true. So we, in this level of force fields, we don't include. Okay, uh, let's uh, thank the speaker again. Thank you.